God is abundantly merciful toward those whom he cares about, and profoundly wrathful toward those whom he detests and rejects in the accounts of the Bible, were there ten servants of God in Sodom? No, there were not. Was the city worthy of being spared by God? Only one person in the city, Lot, received God's messengers. The implication of this is that there was only one servant of God in the city, and thus God had no choice but to save Lot and destroy the city of Sodom. These exchanges between Abraham and God may seem simple, but they illustrate something very profound. There are principles to God's actions, and prior to making a decision he will spend a long time observing and deliberating, before the time is right. He will definitely not make any decisions or jump to any conclusions. The exchanges between Abraham and God show us that God's decision to destroy Sodom was not in the slightest bit wrong, for God already knew that in the city there were not forty righteous, nor thirty righteous, nor twenty. There were not even ten. The only righteous person in the city was Lot. All that happened in Sodom and its circumstances were observed by God, and were as familiar to God as the back of his own hand. Thus, his decision could not be wrong. In contrast, compared to the almightiness of God, man is so numb, so foolish and ignorant, so short-sighted. This is what we see in the exchanges between Abraham and God. God has been issuing forth his disposition from the beginning until today. Here, likewise, there is also the disposition of God that we should see. Numbers are simple, and don't demonstrate anything, but here there is a very important expression of God's disposition. God would not destroy the city because of fifty righteous. Is this due to the mercy of God? Is it because of his love and tolerance? Have you seen this side of God's disposition? Even if there were only ten righteous, God would not have destroyed the city because of these ten righteous people. Is this, or is it not the tolerance and love of God? Because of God's mercy, tolerance, and concern toward those righteous people, he would not have destroyed the city. This is the tolerance of God. And in the end, what outcome do we see? When Abraham said, Preventure ten shall be found there God said, I will not destroy it. After that, Abraham said no more, for within Sodom there were not the ten righteous he referred to, and he had no more to say, and at that time he understood why God had resolved to destroy Sodom. In this, what disposition of God do you see? What kind of resolution did God make? That is, if this city had not ten righteous, God did not permit its existence, and would inevitably destroy it. Is this not the wrath of God? Does this wrath represent God's disposition? Is this disposition the revelation of God's holy substance? Is it the revelation of God's righteous substance, which man must not offend? Having confirmed that there were not ten righteous in Sodom, God was certain to destroy the city, and would severely punish the people within that city, for they opposed God, and because they were so filthy and corrupt. Why have we analyzed these passages in this way? Because these few simple sentences give full expression to God's disposition of abundant mercy and profound wrath. At the same time as treasuring the righteous, and having mercy upon, tolerating, and caring about them, in God's heart there was a deep loathing for all those in Sodom who had been corrupted. Was this, or was it not, abundant mercy and profound wrath? By what means did God destroy the city? By fire. And why did he destroy it using fire? When you see something being burned by fire, or when you are about to burn something, what are your feelings toward it? Why do you want to burn it? Do you feel that you no longer need it, that you no longer wish to look at it? Do you want to abandon it? God's use of fire means abandonment and hate, and that he no longer wished to see Sodom. 
This was the emotion that made God raise Sodom with fire. The use of fire represents just how angry God was. The mercy and tolerance of God do indeed exist, but God's holiness and righteousness when he unleashes his wrath also show man the side of God that brooks no offense. When man is fully capable of obeying the commands of God and acts in accordance to God's requirements, God is abundant in his mercy toward man, when man has been filled with corruption, hatred and enmity for him, God is profoundly angry. And to what extent is he profoundly angry? His wrath will keep on until God no longer sees man's resistance and evil deeds, until they are no longer before his eyes. Only then will God's anger disappear. In other words, no matter who the person is, if their heart has become distant from God, and turned away from God, never to return, then regardless of how, to all appearances or in terms of their subjective desires, they wish to worship and follow and obey God in their body or in their thinking, as soon as their heart turns away from God, God's wrath will be unleashed without cease. It will be such that when God deeply unleashes his anger, having given man ample opportunities, once it is unleashed there will be no way of taking it back, and he will never again be merciful and tolerant of such man. This is one side of God's disposition that tolerates no offense. Here, it seems normal to people that God would destroy a city, for, in God's eyes, a city full of sin could not exist and continue to remain and it was rational that it should be destroyed by God. Yet in that which happened prior to and following his destruction of Sodom, we see the entirety of God's disposition. He is tolerant and merciful toward things that are kind, and beautiful, and good, toward things that are evil, and sinful, and wicked. He is profoundly wrathful, such that he is unceasing in his wrath. These are the two principal and most prominent aspects of God's disposition, and, moreover, they have been revealed by God from beginning to end, abundant mercy and profound wrath. Most of you here have experienced something of God's mercy, but very few of you have appreciated God's wrath. God's mercy and loving kindness can be seen in every person, that is, God has been abundantly merciful toward every person. Yet very rarely, or, it can be said, never, has God been profoundly angry toward any individuals or any section of the people among you here today. Relax. Sooner or later, God's wrath will be seen and experienced by every person, but now is not yet the time. And why is this? Because when God is constantly angry toward someone, that is, when he unleashes his profound wrath upon them, this means that he has long since detested and rejected this person, that he despises their existence, and that he cannot endure their existence, as soon as his anger comes upon them, they will disappear. Today, God's work has yet to reach that point. None of you will be able to stand it once God becomes profoundly angry. You see, then, that at this time God is only abundantly merciful toward you all and you have yet to see his profound anger. If there are those who remain unconvinced, you can ask that God's wrath come upon you, so that you may experience whether or not God's anger and his unoffendable disposition to man really exist. Do you dare? The people of the last days only see God's wrath in his own mind. With him. So, too. Did he have an ever more urgent wish to gain those who were able to carry out his will on earth, and, moreover, to gain a group of people able to break free from the forces of darkness, and not be bound by Satan, and able to bear testimony to him on earth? Gaining such a group of people was God's long-held wish, what he had been waiting for ever since the time of creation. Thus, Regardless of God's use of floods to destroy the world, or of his covenant with man, God's will, frame of mind, plan, and hopes all remained the same. What he wanted to do, which he had yearned for long before the time of creation, 
was to gain those among mankind whom he wished to gain, to gain a group of people able to comprehend and know his disposition, and understand his will, a group who were able to worship him. Such a group of people is truly able to bear testimony to him, and they are, it can be said, his confidants. Today, let us continue retracing the footsteps of God and following the steps of his work, so that we might uncover the thoughts and ideas of God, and everything to do with God, all of which have been kept in storage for so long. Through these things we will come to know the disposition of God, understand the substance of God, we will let God into our hearts, and every one of us will slowly come closer to God, reducing our distance from God. Part of what we talked about last time related to why God established a covenant with man. This time, we will fellowship about the passages of scripture below. Let us begin by reading the scriptures. Abraham 1. God promises to give Abraham a son. Chen 17 15-17 And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. And I will bless her, and give you a son also of her, yes, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations, kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell on his face, and laughed, and said in his heart, Shall a child be born to him that is an hundred years old? And shall Sarah, that is ninety years old, bear? Gen 17, 21-22 but my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear to you at this set time in the next year. And he left off talking with him, and God went up from Abraham. To Abraham offers Isaac, Gen 22, 2-3, and he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and get you into the land of Moria, and offer him there for a burnt offering on one of the mountains which I will tell you. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and split the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up, and went to the place of which God had told him. Gen 22 9 10 And they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there, and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand, and took the knife to slay his son. 